uh, you can uh, uh, start opening a screen. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I'll introduce uh, the uh, current faculty and then uh, we can go ahead with the program. Is that all right for everyone? Do you want me to open the screen already? Yeah, so open. we're not gonna we're not gonna talk to the audience. I, I'm going to introduce to the audience, and then uh, and then I'll make you to start the program. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, good evening. Um, good morning, and welcome all of you to this. Uh, a uh, very vital and basic uh, webinar on um, training microsurgery for residents. A very important question which uh, I and Dr. Elena uh, were asking about why is the need to train our residents, uh, especially all those surgical field. When I was discussing with Dr. Elena, uh, she said, uh, what does the surgical resident mean? I said, it's a completely uh, important topic for all residents belonging to orthopedics, plastic surgeon, vascular surgery, oncosurgery, and almost all entire subspeciality of surgery. I think this is one uh, phenomenal uh, technical expertise which everyone needs to uh, get trained and make, make themselves uh, you know, a versatile scholar uh, in, making them, uh, in making their speciality uh, more and more uh, inter interesting and uh, more and more uh, uh, making it more and more uh, refined. With this brief introduction, uh, we have a panelist, we have a great team of panelists today uh, to talk about uh, the training for microsurgery uh, to residents. Uh, to start with, I have the, um, Dr. Elena, who uh, is the, uh, uh, the brain behind this uh, entire program, and she was the one who could you know, organize the fantastic team uh, from different parts of the world. I think uh, we should be very uh, thankful for her, uh, spending her time making a team and uh, more focused towards training the residents. I think today's uh, 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 webinar will definitely give a message to all of us. Uh, how are we committed to uh, our next generations? We are building our next generations, not training microsurgery alone, but imparting a knowledge to the next generations. Join with us are, we have uh, Dr. Konstantin, uh, Dr. Julia, uh, Dr. Mikhail, and Dr. Sendil Murgan uh, from India. So I think uh, this is the time we have to start with a brief uh, introduction uh, to of all the panelists by Dr. Elena when, once the talk is over. So I request uh, Dr. Elena to start the program uh, with a talk followed by subsequently the panelists who will contribute to this topic. Thank you, Dr. Elena, please go ahead. Okay, great. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Terence. It was a big pleasure for me to uh, finally join this um, amazing program that Dr. Terence running and uh, join the big uh, line of names in microsurgery and finally talk about why is it important to teach microsurgery to, um, I would think, every resident. Um, in the world, <laughs> so it's a big plan. It's uh, maybe a little bit too wide, but you know, if you don't have a big dream, uh, you don't succeed. So I really think that teaching microsurgery um, in any institution in any capacity to everybody will be very beneficial. And I'm going to talk about what do we do at Columbia University. Um, why do we teach people and who do we teach and uh, why is it important? And I'm really happy to bring this uh, beautiful uh, team of people who are my friends and who are my co-workers and colleagues from um, India and from Russia. And this is really important for me because that's my motherland and it's um, really great so we can introduce what's done in this part of the world in um, uh, microsurgical education and i'm going to talk about uh, each of uh, everybody in the panel after i'm completed but i really uh helpful uh very happy and thankful for everybody to join this talk so um briefly about myself this is um i who doesn't know me uh i hope we have a lot of people who do but um i'm a veterinarian by training i finished moscow veterinary academy and uh, become a microsurgeon by i would say pure luck 
in my um, uh, adventure to become a veterinarian in a different country when I moved in 1992 to US from Moscow. And uh, since 1996, I joined the microsurgery lab at Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Columbia University, New York. And since that, the microsurgery become big, big part of my life. And for now, we started very small, teaching very few people from very few programs. And we grew over these years to teach about 200 people a year from about 60 institutions around the US and about 70 countries. Um, we probably train everybody, more, more than 4,000 people over these years. I never really counted, but probably more than that. I actively participate in a lot of societies that, that involve microsurgery uh, in the US and in the world. And we, um, we do conduct the research as well in the hand and plastic surgery. And it's really great to have that going as the part of microsurgical education. So history of education in US goes to even before that, so 1960 and, and even earlier. Uh, but this is uh, the fathers of uh, teaching microsurgery, Dr. Robert Ackland, that we all know, started teaching in um, 1975, created a beautiful course in Louisville, Kentucky. He uh, did a lot of videos, a lot of um, books, and this was um, a great development in the teaching part of microsurgery because we all know you can't just come and do microsurgery. You have to really do a lot of training. Uh, in my department, Dr. Harold Dick uh, established the microsurgery lab in 1980. And he was a well-known, uh, world-known, very great doctor in pediatric oncology, hand and microsurgery. And that um, legacy was kept by Dr. Melvin Rosenwasser. He is my boss and he is a great guy and he's an awesome microsurgeon and is a big support um, in my career and developing of microsurgery lab uh, at, the, at the my department. So, this is who we train. So, as Dr. Karen said, we on, we don't only train plastics, or pl you know, plastic surgeon and hand surgeon. About twelve specialty coming to the micro lab at Columbia. So, this is the only a few that I mentioned: the ENT, hand, uh, head and neck, maxillofacial transplant, neurosurgery, vascular ophthalmology, OBGYN, veterinarians, and researchers. And they all take in the whole course. This you can see the microsurgery is important, not only for hand and um, plastic and ortho for a lot of different people. And this is great. So we teach people from, um, as I said, a lot around the world. You can see the pictures. I just put a few and then you can see the different countries that come in. And, and we do have mandatory for all our residents to take the classes um, when they PGY3 and PGY5. And they really enjoy that. And no matter what they do in orthopedics, doing joints, spine, doing sports, um, they all take the course and they really enjoy that. And it's a big deal. It's a big part of their training. Um, why we need the training? Because we all know, we're all microsurgeons, or maybe not, but you should know microsurgery is very difficult and very demanding surgical skill. And does it does need to be trained in the control environment and by the instructor who is very experienced, who can share uh, his expertise and skills. Um, I really think that it's just like a motto of my work from all this 25 years in microsurgery. You do become a better surgeon after completing the microsurgery courses. You do grow as a surgeon and maybe as a person because it's a lot of psychology involved in this um, training. So I am really happy to have these two um, uh, Norway surgeons and me on the step stool, we all grow. And I, love, I really love that picture. So it shows how do uh, you become um, a bigger in your career. Why microsurgery is so challenging? 
And this is just a really few points and all of my panelists will agree with that because microsurgery is a little different than the surgery that you do um, in a big scale. It's very fine motions and it's a different hand position. You're not, mo you're not really moving. People get fatigued very easily. You do need to pay attention to details, work with fragile tissue. I'm going to talk about that a little later. It's very frustrating as well. And it's, um, it's a little different from everything that you've done before. I always show that picture and this is where you will understand why um, microsurgery needs to be trained in a lab. Just watch this and uh, you'll understand that. I just, I just recorded that during one of my training sessions, just as a class. I couldn't believe this. The surgeon did this. How, how did he do it? He didn't even know. But life is full of mistakes and we need, things do happen. But we all agree that if this kind of things, mistakes, better happen in a lab and a lie in a control environment than in operating room. So this is uh, my lab. This is, you can see, um, how do I work? So it's three microscopes. It's uh, they're all uh, connected to the video camera and monitors. So it's only three students and they work um, at the same time and doing different, could be sometimes doing different exercises, but I could see what they do. And it's uh, really interesting to see and be connected to them, not through the mi microscope, but through the uh, monitors and the switch and the cameras. So this uh, people are working on the end to side, as you can see, and it's really stress free environment because it's only three people, music playing, people are talking or chatting or not. And I can always come through on the other side of the scope and see what they do if they have questions and show them what they need to know. So keeping a small class is important uh, because as we talk about it, unique um, one on one training is important. There are bigger classes, of course, and that's great. It's a little bit more stressful for instructor and maybe more for the students, um, but it, it doesn't matter. Training is a training, but when I have this opportunity to keep the lab small and teach one on one, uh, with a full time instructor is um, pretty that makes the course unique. We do have OR quality microscopes and very good instruments and we work on the live animals. So I don't believe in using the scraps instrument, whatever they don't need in the operating room. I buy everything new because this is important. It's hard enough and you do have to have a good instruments and the models that the people can um, enjoy and work. So it's, instead of struggling with the bad instruments. So this is what we do, and this is the course that we teach. Uh, it's 40 hours, so Monday through Friday. People start working with, very often, I have people who has no skills, zero. They come, they could be surgeons, or they are most of them surgeons, but they never operated on the microscope. And you start very slowly, and you put them on a the microscope on the plastic glove, and they are learning how to sit correctly, how to tie knots using the microscope, which are very different than the tying knots as the surgeons. We do different techniques using a um, live animal model. Our learning curve is pretty high. So I'm pretty and jumping very quickly from the plastic glove to the animal. And I found it that it is, is it even if it's difficult, it's challenging, but the learning curve is very high and people learning much faster and quicker. So this is what we do. We start with end-to-end -end arterial anastomosis on the artery, one millimeter diameter, different techniques moving to the vein, a uh, simple vein, then interpositional vein graft, end to side, different end to sides, peripheral nerve. Um, this is one of my uh, students. He will share what he did. Hi, I'm Robert. I'm one of the PTY form plastics residents. I'm just about to just finish this uh, interpositional vein graft. And some of the nice things I learned um, were uh, the use of the open stitch technique for both the anterior and the posterior wall. Uh, to remember to really clean up that end so you can get uh, some good stitches and um, 
finally to, to really make use of the left hand for, for the appropriate counter tension. Very good. Congratulations. That's a great interpositional rank graph. Awesome. Thanks. So you can see this is why. This is one of the points. So the, by by using the coming to the lab, this is what they are learning. And it's as you would agree, they it's useful for every surgeon. Doesn't matter what you do microsurgery or not. You're using how to sit correctly, how to have your hand position uh, uh, right. As Robert said, you're utilizing your hands better, and you're learning that by doing. So you're learning that surgical preparation and setup of your field are very important. You also learning how to dissect uh, gently, how to handle the tissue with microscopic environment, which is very different. And you're also learning surgical tricks to visualize everything you're doing. I do insist that everybody zooming in and using magnification. And as my uh, student said, so sometimes like open stitch technique will be very useful. But again, they're learning it by doing. And this is very important by doing this. Um, courses. So we also teach advanced microsurgery course in including super microsurgery for people who wants to do lymphatics. And it is recommended uh, by me uh, using for more experienced surgeons and who do completed micro basic course because advanced jumps from uh, just doing simple artery to the free tissue flap. And it is working again five days and working to the smaller, much smaller vessels. And if you can see, if we're using epigastric vessels, they are 0.3 to 0.5 millimeter diameter. And this is quite a challenging work. And we can do uh, grafting and to side the simple, um, uh, simple vessels. And it's it's quite challenging. So it is um, uh, really advanced stuff for people who already um, experience this, just a few exercises that people do. It's also tailored to the people who had done some work and have a specific goals. So this is a very happy, excited uh, student who just finished the free tissue flap. He is um, PG5 going to the hand fellowship. He was really happy to, to give me this testimonial. Oops, sorry about that. All right, so this is the last day of the course, and I am absolutely ecstatic with everything that I've learned. I mean, take a look at that graph. It's incredible. Um, today we did a free flap, artery and vein. There you can see the anastomosis. All right, so we did an anterior approach to the thigh of the uh, rat. Here you can see in the rat model the femoral artery, the femoral vein. Dissected all the way out. Here is the epigastric artery and vein, which we kept intact. Now we took a flat from the contralateral side. We brought it over and we anastomosed the artery to the artery and the vein to the vein. And this is a uh, end to side anastomosis for both. They're both patent, as you can see, with the blue blood flow on the vein and the pink blood flow on the artery. Very good. So this is a groin cutaneous flap, right? Correct. So I have a skin fat and a femoral as a pedicle. Wow, it's standing up. It's so patent. Amazing. Yeah. So he was really happy and this is makes my work very satisfying because you see people come. He came with no skills at all. He never worked under microscope is a, you know, PG by 5. They will have very little experience with the microscope and look after 5 days. He was successfully finishing up the uh, free tissue flap. You can see, so sometimes people come from neurosurgery and they are interested in doing uh, work on carotids. And this is side to side. This is a uh, bridge done between uh, two carotids using the femoral. This is quite advanced exercises, but it do um, you help a neurosurgeons to work uh, the field that they are operating. So this is the another student of mine who came from Colombia, and he's a neurosurgical resident. Again, he came with no skills. He came for two weeks. He did basic and advanced, and this is his finishing up. Hello again, I'm Diego. I'm from Colombia. I'm a neurosurgery resident there. We just did this. Uh, these are the carotids, and this is the femoral artery. We perform an interpositional bypass. This is very useful again for all the intracranial uh, vascular pathologies. And I think this course has been very, very useful.
for my clinical practice in the future. So this is how and why. People who do the course are learning not only putting vessels together, they're learning how to coordinate your eye, your hand, your foot, because my uh, microscopes are pedal control and hopefully the brain as well. So they also learning how to do the surgical planning step by step, which is very important for every surgical resident, not just do, you have to plan ahead and uh, do step by step. Pay attention to details. Everybody here will agree without that microsurgery is just not possible. While they're doing the work, I give them room to do mistakes and learn how to problem solving. So they are learning on their own with my help sometimes, sometimes on their own, but I really want them after five days be much more confident and comfortable in operating room. So whatever happens, we all surgeons, we all know stuff happens during the operation. They need to not panic. They need to know how to do stuff and fix this. So after every exercise, I do need assessment. So every surgeon, and we all agree, need to know what are they done and how well they do this. So you can use machines. Um, I have this trans, um, transonic Euroflow in my lab and we can do quality assessment by uh, machine, by the, um, uh, it's like a Doppler and you can see post pre-operative and post-operative flow, but I really trust the old school when you do uh, have this exercise looking at the, now we by the instructor. Now we're examining the exercise that did not work 100%. We want to see what, what happened. And you can see that there is a small back wall stitch right here on the corner, which you can really see from outside of the anastomosis. And there is also some uh, small strings of adventitia from one wall to another on the vein, on the venotomy. That is was uh, also a mistake done by the student. But this is how you evaluate that to side. And uh, that's what we did. And we're going to do it again and hopefully avoid those mistakes. So this is an idea. So people who do mistakes, you do need to point them. You need to show them because sometimes it's not really obvious. And this is very important. So this is how uh, we do this all the time. And again, why do we need to teach microsurgery? Because this is important for every surgeon. You do need to learn how to honestly evaluate your own work, not by with yourself and by help with an instructor because every instructor need to look what you've done and why you did this and what to do to fix it. Mistakes are welcome in a course. So people get more frustrated, of course, but this is the right way of learning for the surgery. You do need to make mistakes. And then sometimes like the people are get upset. I was like, oh my God, what I've done. But I feel a little bit happy because I know that he will remember or she will remember what they've done and we go over how to fix it. Now, psychology is very important. We're all surgeons. We all know that short fuse of the pa uh, patients and the frustration is setting in very uh, quickly. So if you get more frustrated, you're doing worse and you're doing worse, you get more frustrated. So it's like a circle. So self-control and patient in microsurgery is very important. Again, doing the courses like this will teach you how to self-control, how to stop, to take a breath, talk, walk away, whatever it is you do, that you come back refreshed and put your mind off and you do better. So all of this you can learn during the courses. I also say quality over the timing. You, you do core, you do care for the quality of your work, not how fast you go. The speed will come as you become more comfortable and more confident in your work and you tie and do everything faster, but the quality of the work has to be for well. You have to go fast. So again, this is why teaching microsurgery is very important. Well, now this is uh, a little bit, a uh, few words about new things because this pandemic, I start doing virtual courses. Not that easy 
but it is uh, possible to teach people um, outside your lab. So this is, I taught people, uh, this is my favorite <laughs> from um, Chile. And this yeah, is how we did this virtual microsurgery uh, course. Microsurgical training. And, um, and if you can please share really briefly your setup so we can see how did you make it work so I can see you and you can see me. Please. Okay. Okay. Well, I have here my microscope. Okay. Yeah. She can type and I'm using my uh, phone camera. Mm -hmm. so I put the phone in a box to make the distance to the she can type. So I created a small defect. Uh, in the artery, we do an interpositional vein graft. Uh, okay. I'm going to explain it to Gonzalo, and he's going to follow me and do exactly the same thing on his. Uh... So this is how it worked uh, during pandemic when nobody can come. I uh, set up my microscope connected to the camera to the i um, the laptop. And we will be able to work together. Hopefully, Gonzalo here too. And I will say hello to you. And it was great to teach him because he is a veterinarian. He had a microscope at home. He was lucky one. But that was a great course. It showed me that virtual training is possible. It's not easy, but it is possible. And it widens horizon of teaching to a lot of people uh, throughout the world. Uh, then when the lab start uh, opening, I actually at some point did the both. Okay, this is courses. the positional it was graph funny. Day in the microsurgery so, lab. Yeah, people this were doing the both model. at the same time. Dr. Liana from orthopedic surgery doing this live. And this is the chicken model right here. It's Dr. Gonzalo from Chile doing the same thing virtually. So it is possible. Everything is possible when you put your mind into that. But that was pretty cool. During pandemic, we tried um, to to teach. So the lab is uh, alive and the teaching is alive. This is was funny example when I had a great guy from Mexico who didn't speak a word of English, but I was lucky enough to have my virtual intern. She was Dominican speak, uh, Dominican speaking Spanish, and it was funny. She translated everything what I done, so it sounded like that. You can cut the vein, and you can um, irrigate. La puede puede cortar la vena y después irrigarla. Okay. That was interesting. So you experience this, because we're gonna be pulling on this. Yeah, I uh, suture. The the put the the next uh, next two stitches uh, together. So you got an idea. That was an interesting experience. It shows again, everything is possible. Teaching virtually, it is possible even to other countries, even with another language. Uh, but it is all fun uh, to do. And uh, to finish this, this is a um, great testimonial. I can do many of them, but this is one of the guy who from the head and neck that he will summarize what he learned during his course. Hi everyone, my name is Russell Dang and I'm an oral maxillofacial surgeon by training and I'm currently a maxillofacial and oncology fellow at uh, Boston Medical Center. I came to this course after hearing from a lot of people about the expectations of learning microsurgery, learning about suturing and how to handle blood vessels, but however, what I want to say is that this course is more than just microsurgery. When I got here, I learned about handling fragile tissues, about maintaining my focus, about not being frustrated when you don't get a suture, about good posture. So, yes, I learned how to suture our raisin veins and nerves, but what I gained was a skill set, a skill set that will help me in any surgical field that I practice in the future. And my message would be for everyone who is in a surgical specialty to implore the opportunity to come and do a basic or an advanced microsurgery course, and you will see the benefits that it brings to your practice. Thank you. So this will summarize my talk. And um, coming uh, to um, Russia very recently, actually a couple of weeks ago, I was very happy to see that people are 
um, very excited to learn microsurgery, and I did a couple of courses uh, with Dr. Zelia in a micro lab, and it was awesome experience when people come from different, uh, even part of the country, and they were very excited to learn uh, microsurgery. We did course in Tomsk with Institute of Micros uh, Microsurgical Institute, the only institute in, the, in Russia, and that was awesome experience as well and we i can see that people are uh, from different specialties with different ages and different experience all come together and they start getting more and more excited about learning that i'm really happy that i have panelists who are from this country and from russia and they are doing an amazing job uh working uh with this um skill so this is my information. If anybody wants to uh, email me or come and train with me, or you know, you all welcome. This is information um, for contacting me. I'm open with the email. Please, all the questions. If I don't have time, I can see the popping up the questions. But we'll, hopefully, we'll have time to answer that. But I would love to see you guys. And thank you very much for your attention. And hopefully. Um, we will continue with, uh, with this education in the future. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Elena. That was an outstanding and remarkable and a significant uh, you know, contribution of your microsurgical training to all the trainees in various specialties. I think that was a splendid uh, talk. Uh, we really enjoyed and learned uh, many aspects, even though uh, we do a lot of microsurgery, but then you said uh, the basic uh, surgical skills and also your psychological aspect of you know, uh, accepting failures and, uh, you know, uh, getting back from the failures. I think that's what uh, all the microsurgeons need to do. Uh, we, we, we tend to fail in circumstances, uh, especially uh, very critical cases. And then we have to uh, come back. We have to come back, uh, rejuvenate ourselves. If time permits, I think we have to go back to the lab and get ourselves, uh, you know, refreshed with some uh, basics. As you could I think uh, your talk was an outstanding. Um, uh, we have a we may be getting a lot of questions in the chat box um and i uh, thank you for your uh, excellent talk um i request uh, dr elena uh, to introduce the panelists here i think uh, you are the one right person who can uh, you know introduce all those uh, panelists uh, and then uh, um, uh, they can share the screens uh, uh, to have their uh, experiences and then they can share their uh, values about microsurgical training very good. Do we have some to you? Awesome. So um, this is great. Let me start with you because I probably know in you the longest. So Dr. Sintil Morgan working in India and you're still in Chennai, right? So and um, he developed this um, uh, Institute of Teaching Microsurgery. He's my long stand friend and I'm really happy you came to this panel like on the last minute like is everybody else and um, he's been teaching microsurgery in india for a long time and i would like him to share what his experience is and um, i will enjoy his talk thanks Sintel. dr Sintel, uh, i've made you as a presenter now um, you can uh, share your screen uh, and you can give a talk now Uh, Dr. Elena, if he finds difficulty, probably we can move to the other speaker so that he can get himself ready. Um, okay, no problem. All right. Then um, let me introduce Konstantin Selenina. So uh, Konstantin works in, in Tomsk, is in a big oh, and the only one microsurgical institute in Russia. He is a plastic surgeon. And he's working and teaching microsurgery 
Um, I'm not sure for how long, but it's been a while. And I know Constantine for a while as well. And I've been teaching with him for a couple of times now in Tomsk. And I know they do an amazing job uh, with his um, boss and my friend, Dr. Betinker and Oksana Kurichkina. And uh, they're doing an uh, amazing job bringing microsurgical education to the higher level. So, Kostya, you can uh, take the stage. Thank you, Elena. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, a little about myself. Uh, I am Konstantin Selenov. I am from Tomsk, from Institute of Microsurgery. I am plastic and plastic surgery and microsurgeon, and I am professor of Department of Operative Anatomy in Siberian Medical University. Uh, my report uh, not big. It's a small. Uh, teaching the basics of microsurgery, how we do it in Institute of Microsurgery. A little about Institute. Our Institute was founded in 1994 in the city of Tomsk. Uh, the structure of Institute has two scientific laboratories, a clinic for 25 beds, and you can see on this slide our operation room in the Institute. Uh, the first training course of, at the Research Institute of Microsurgery was in 2011. Uh, you can see a full view of this class, this collaboration of uh, Siberian Medical University and uh, uh, from Germany. Uh, education license of our institute. Uh, education microsurgical class of the Research Institute of Microsurgery. You can see four technoscopes of company Major Techno connected to video cameras. And you can see on the book how we do it. And individual box, wet lab, Japan for training the vascular suture. Uh, cycle, cycle curriculum, uh, total 36 hours. Uh, you can see names of discipline sections and topics, basics of microsurgery, history of microsurgery, models for teaching microsurgical skills, vascular and suture techniques, and final examinations one hour. Uh, in 2012, we published workshop introductions of microsurgery. Uh, on this slide, you can see the number of cadets training at the Research Institute of Microsurgery for 10 years. There are nine, 96 cadets, uh, geography, Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, Austria. Uh, of course, we uh, work with uh, uh, our colleagues from other countries, and you can see collaboration with uh, Columbia University, New York. Uh, in the framework of the first and second microsurgical summit in Siberia 2019 and 20 and 21. And the course moderator was Yelena Kelina. A special issue of journal issues of reconstructive and plastic surgery dedicated to the world experience in teaching microsurgery. Uh, authors from 11 countries. And you can see this journal of our site, website. Uh, with conclusion, uh, I want to say what training program of, program of microsurgery allow the formation of initial microsurgical skills, which later become the basis for professional growth. Methods involved in teaching microsurgical skills should take into account the wishes of the trainers and be technologically and professionality prepared to implement them. We see the future development of educational programs in the introduction of a section on training, super microsurgery and the involvement of robotic and virtual system for practical practicing practical skills. And thank you for attention and sorry for my not good English. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Elena, I think uh, uh, Dr. Senthil is ready now. Can we ask him to start? 
Um, okay, so thank you, Constantine. That was great. You're doing amazing work. Um, so, Sintil, are you ready? So, doctors, well, I don't want to introduce you again. I already did. So, uh, I will just uh, ask you to take the stage and talk about the training in India. So, please unmute yourself. I think you're unmute, but we can't hear you. Well, he has problems with his computer, I think. Dr. Sendil? Okay. All right. Well, let him figure it out and uh, we'll move on with our panelists. So, uh, Julia Babaiva is our next speaker. Uh, it's um, good, my good friend, and she is uh, working in the first Moscow State Univ Medical University in Minnesota, and she is an um, uh, amazing uh, woman who is organizing a microsurgical education in Moscow, and then probably the first one also in Moscow as well. And this is um, a great pleasure to have her and Mike uh, Mikhail, who works they work together. And they are pushing microsurgical education on much higher level in the higher education in Moscow. Julia, if you can uh, take the stage, it would be great. Okay. Hello. Uh, should I share my okay. screen again? Yes. Yeah, please, please share, share your screen. I've made a presenter now. You can go ahead. Okay. I can't see the presentation. Sorry. There's an option called share at the bottom. You need to click the option yes, share. Yes, but I. I already closed it. I don't know why I did it. You can go back and start from your desktop. Click the option share. Yes, the... but I should open it here. Okay. Perhaps I think it should be the next one. Perhaps Len, perhaps the next one. I should find it in my computer. Okay. All right, then. Okay. I'll let you I'll give you a couple of minutes. Find your presentation. So, Michael, you will be our next one. So talking from the station of Institute. So Michael um, is working with uh, Julia and he's working with the students. So she works with the residents and teaching microsurgery. Michael goes even more broader and teaching a lot of uh, students and organize the class in um, in the club. And the surgical club and this is great if we can have him present what is a uh, great job they do so um michael uh so here we go thank you very much uh thank you very much for the introduction um it's true i was uh anticipating to go last because uh, my presentation is essentially uh, a question to all of us, which you raised previously, uh, and thank you for that, Yelena. Why we need to teach microsurgery to every surgical resident, and uh, with the addition of a question, and students too, maybe. Okay, so I'll just make my point. So uh, a quick uh, introduction about us: we're a reconstructive and plastic surgery and microsurgery club, uh, and I work with medical students and residents and. Essentially, anybody who's welcome, our doors are opened. We started in 2015 as a voluntary organization. And for the past six years, we've been working on many, a variety of projects together, uh, one of which is microsurgical training for our students. So when uh, we talk about this, often we're approached with the question, why do you start training so early? What is the point? Uh, students don't even know their anatomy well yet. Well, to be truthful, even some experienced surgeons don't know their anatomy that well. So uh, the point is, uh, the first thing when you start trading is you feel regret that you didn't start earlier. So while a student is still a student, he has many years ahead of him. So why not utilize his free time? He can make free time for it to practice his surgical skills. Theoretical and practically training are definitely not mutually exclusive and more so they go parallel to each other. And so uh, in order to build this opportunity for students, we started our club in which we focus on several things. I'm not gonna go through the entire specter of things that we do, they're up on the slide, but as you can see, the result of the work of our club was meeting absolutely amazing people. 
uh, all over the world. And uh, this was achieved by joining together. We even managed to uh, meet Paul, uh, uh, Professor Taylor, uh, Ian Taylor uh, on the 20th, 18th International Course on Perforated Flaps. And for our students and even for myself, it was absolutely thrilling experience to see these type of people who are at the building block of uh, microsurgery and clinical microsurgery. Um, we help the students not only get a taste for research work, we also get them into the operating room. We get them to see how a microsurgical brigade works. And this is also important because there's there are many logistical issues. If you just give somebody who knows microsurgical skills uh, an entrance into the operating room, one of the first things he'll do, he'll grab the microscope. Well, you have to be prepared to the fact that the microscope is not sterile. The microscope has to have special um, covering, uh, which is sterile. So there's many aspects to the microsurgical clinical life which are of valuable experience to learn to the students themselves. This is why we start early. And by the time they're in residency, they can go into deeper and more advanced courses, like with Professor Akelina or in Tomsk Institute of Microsurgery and even here in Moscow. And finally, the practical training, uh, a step-by-step -step approach to each student. And what I mean by step-by-step -step is I don't segregate. Uh, we do not segregate at all students. It depends on how much the student wants to take from the program. We will give even up to uh, serious clinical experiments where we do uh, reconstructive surgeries on live animals. We actually have a special operating room for the students, students but we start with introduction to tissues. So beginning surgeons understand that knowing tissues it's something that is very important. And Professor Akilina pointed out to <laughs> make an accent on this. And I absolutely agree that tissue, understanding biological tissues, how they work, how they feel, how they differentiate from each other is a very valuable experience. And if a student brings that to his residential work, then he's set for life, All right? And one of the last things uh, our club teaches, of course, is teamwork. Our students uh, support each other and we support them. And uh, eventually all of these students will become high class specialists and they will become professors and academicians and PhDs and because their future is ahead of them. Nobody rarely falls out of uh, the medical course once they get into surgery. It's a, a difficult decision to make to leave, but it's an even more difficult decision to make to get into. So the goal of our club besides giving the basic surgical skills for the reason I went over is to give the students a foundation on which they could build upon. And one thing I wanted to point, to, point out specifically uh, besides providing opportunity and understanding their long journey is that medicine and medical training should not be a competition. It should not be one school against the other who's better and who's worse it should be uh, on focusing to provide better health care for the patient that's all and as such what you have to do as a clinician or a surgeon already in training and the higher you go the more you have to give away to younger students this is what we believe and this is what many this is even the motto of mayo clinic okay priority is the patient care Right, so we give the best experience that we can to future medical specialists. All right, so I thank you very much for having me for my short, very short introduction about student training in microsurgery. And thank you to our wonderful hosts and Professor Akelina and Alberto who participated. And remember, keep positive and everything will come to you. So if it's possible, start little student clubs where you could give back to the community little by little. Thank you very much. That's all I have today. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Michael. That was great, great idea to start very young and then keep them and give them to Dr. Uh, Julia to take them as a residence and move them further uh, to develop their microsurgical skills. So, Yule, uh, Julia, you are Absolutely. next. And thank, thank you, you Misha. I'll try. I'll try so, my best. <laughs> Let's try your best. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we can do. We're all trying our best here.
Uh, I'm gonna yes. mute myself and you're gonna take the stage. I don't know what happened. Yeah. 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 Perfect. <laughs> it's good. Okay. I'm very glad to see all of you and be a part of this meeting. So I would like to share uh, our experience about step-by-step -step, uh, teaching microsurgery, microsurgery training. And I will be short, I think. This is our history and we have talk about it a little bit. We started in 2010 and our um, academy uh, Nikola Milayev was the first who conducted a uh, microsurgery course in Russia. And then we uh, conducted more than 20 courses and taught uh, microsurgery more than 20, 250 people. Here are the teachers, our teachers. And uh, if the mission of the first course was to remind the new generation of plastic surgeons, uh, about microsurgery and spark their interest in it. Now our mission is to promote microsurgery among uh, surgeons of all specialties in order to improve the quality of medicine, medical care in, and the effectiveness of medical treatment in Russia. Uh, we based our training uh, on the two following concepts. Microsurgery is a multifunctional method that it can be applied in all surgical areas. And the other concept of uh, moving from simple to more complex. So we conduct step-by-step -step training courses. We bring together um, our instructors from all fields of medicine. Uh, so we notice that students find it easier to find the common language when the instructor works in the same medical field as themselves. So they um, do not hesitate to ask questions and such communication often turns into the friendship and mentoring. So um, them. Uh, concept of moving from simple, uh, simple to more complex in practice, uh, those step by step training. In uh, the first step is a basic training, two day course, we, which is called uh, Introduction to Microsurgery. The second step course is the advanced training course, uh, which allows better immersion in microsurgery and we um, carried out exercises on a biological model, a wide lab rat there. And the third uh, step uh, is the um, clinical course. Uh, one week practice in, uh, in the surgery unit where microsurgery is performed. Uh, so, it gives the opportunity to immerse oneself in a clinical practice and become a member of the microsurgical team for one week. Uh, to support our graduates, um, we uh, introduce a system of similar to the one used of uh, martial arts. Uh, and instead of bells, we have our branded caps with a uh, message, I'm a microsurgeon. And those who um, get 10 successful microsurgeries uh, get green belt, 30 uh, uh, brown belt, yes, and 100 uh, successful microsurgeries have uh, black, black belt. Naturally, our teachers have got black belts, uh, and even one our, of our graduates was awarded a black belt already. Uh, after calculating the number of doctors, uh, residents, and students, we have already helped gain skills and knowledge in microsurgery. We decided to find out if our practical courses really help surgeons to start using microsurgery in their practice. We ask them to fill out a questionnaire and uh, we are happy to share results. Even uh, the basic training, the first step training course, helped start a career in microsurgery to 10% of the respondents. So 
Uh, after taking the basic training course, doctors are able to perform their own microsurgery. This is the reason why they didn't start practicing microsurgery uh, on their own, and we can see that uh, we can't influence them. Uh, after finishing the first step, uh, only 67% uh, of the respondents took the second step of training. So uh, this justifies our step-by-step -step approach to the training. Not all participants who took the basic course are interested in further training. Uh, before coming to the advanced course, the vast majority already had experience in microsurgery, so they knew exactly what they were going to apply their knowledge to. Uh, and we think that step-by-step uh, -step approach to microsurgery uh, training enables the participants to ease into their microsurgical experience and also choosing the frequency of training classes and whether they want to further improve of their skills or not. And the good uh, percent, um, percentage, 82% of respondents believe that the step-by-step -step approach to the training and the concept of moving from simple to more complex is most efficient and understandable and comfortable for them. This is our team and we are happy to be a part of, te of teachers of microsurgery. That's all. That's great, perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. This is amazing work. And um, I'm really happy that you guys are keep going and that's a 20th already, so it's a big deal. And keep going, please. And um, I'll be happy to participate one day, maybe, and share our experience to work together uh, one day. Everything will be. Yes, I, I believe so too. Um, so, um, next one. So, Julia, thank you very much. And Michael, and I'm thank really you. wishing uh, Institute of Session of huge success in uh, keep going and that microsurgical education. Um, we stay in Moscow now, and our next uh, presenter will be Dr. Uh, Zelia Yakupova, and she is a neurosurgeon from another big institution in Moscow and she will take the stage now and she organized herself on her own uh, private um, uh, idea of uh, on a pr private settings and a micro lab that people can learn and practice and um, she is an amazing uh, young surgeon who is very enthusiastic in education I'm really glad I've met her and we worked together and I was impressed with um, a lot of things that she've done on her own. So with not much of support of the big institutions, she is a um, fantastic girl and I really wish uh, her best of luck. And I'm happy to work with her uh, here now and in the future. So Zelia, please take the stage. Uh, hello, thank you very much. Uh, I am problem, I'm not my present. That's the option at the bottom share you need to click the button share and start presenting your screen i have made you as a presenter now you can share your screen by clicking the share button sorry You don't have a share button? She will be on in a second. We have a lot of technical difficulties, <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's, it, it's really hard for, you know, people, you know, in a different, different machines to work with this thing. Um, but we, we did, so maybe we can answer some questions so far. Is Cintil, is Dr. Cintil is on? 
Yeah, Dr. Sintil is there. We can try Dr. Sintil now. She, she joined. Ah. Yeah, Celia, you ready? She's uh, not presenter uh, uh, function yet. I made a oh, presenter now. Yes. I'm sure, yes. I'm ready. Perfect. Great. Mm -hmm. Make it a full screen. So I, I'm ready. Uh, hello, everyone. Glad to see. My name is Yakupova Zilia. I am 25. I am a neurosurgery resident of uh, Nikolai Nikolaevich Burdenka National Medical Research Center of Neurosurgery in Moscow. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, uh, founder director of the microsurgical laboratory for doctors, residents, and students in microlab in Moscow, Russia. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about the role of microsurgery in neurosurgery. I am an assistant in microsurgical operations, talking place of the brain and spinal cord using high stage equipment in, uh, on, uh, um, in the learning ledges center of the Burdenko Neurosurgery Re Research Institute. Uh, no doubt all our operations are performed using microscopes while the neurosurgeon walks standing up and this makes the task very difficult as a rule the operation can last from 7 up to 12 hours or more with the help of a microscope we can see small vessels of the brain a neurosurgical operation using microsurgery with disease such as uh, uh, first neuro-oncology, epidemoma, spinal region tumors, tumors of the cranial nervous, uh, vascular tumors, neuroepithelial tumors, mesenchymical tumors, and um, meningeal E and pituitary tumors, uh, two vascular vascular neurosurgery, aneurysms, extracranial, intracranial, uh, bypass, ECMA, vascular malformations, uh, uh, neurotrauma, interventricular gemorrhages, uh, uh, various spinal trauma. Uh, for spinal neurosurgery, intra uh, extramedullary tumors, extradular tumors, uh, vertebral body tumors, uh, tumor-like masses, various degenerative diseases, uh, ETC, uh, five uh, uh, pediatric neurosurgery, developmental anim uh, an anomalies, uh, um, brain system tumors, uh, four, four uh, ventricular and posterior fossa tumors, uh, six uh, functional and uh, peripheral nerve uh, neurosurgery. Um, a neurosurgical operation is a duel between the neurosurgeon and the disease. Uh, as in the bo boxing ring, the, uh, the three basic ways to strike at your opponent. For the boxer, where the job, uh, hook and a uh, uh, For the neurosurgeon, where dissection, gymnastic and microsurgical suturing. The answer to the question of how uh, to become a good Neurosurgeon was given by Ukishri, uh, I and uh, included three key points. Uh, first, uh, basic microsurgical skills such as uh, dissection, gymnastic, and anastomosis should be mastered on plastic tubs, cadaver vessels, and laboratory animals. Uh, Second, good anatomical knowledge of different approaches uh, should be updated during cadaver dissection. Third, manual skills uh, should be consolidated when assisting with and performing surgery under the supervision and of an experienced neurosurgeon teacher. Uh, 
to be the best in a research practice, you need a lot of training hours of using a microscope. And I came up with the idea to organize a separate microsurgical laboratory uh, for doctors, residents, and students in uh, Russia, Moscow. The training is held every weekend. I'm also a teacher. How now we have uh, 12 areas where I can use microsurgery and we are constantly training to improve your skills. Uh, we have um, the 12 microscope, uh, our specialist, uh, our 12 uh, specialists. Um, mm, uh, neurosurgery model training in microsurgery, our laboratory, it is training for uh, aneurysm clipping using a human placenta, double to enterocyte anastomosis in carotid arteries uh, of a right, biomaterials of animal origin, sheep, bearing, sheep brain. Mm. Uh, conclusion, uh, performing microsurgical operation requires a great uh, uh, physical strength, constant creativity and skill improvement. This is not only a skill that uh, requires high uh, perception appreciation, but also a, an art that only a person who is in love with this work and uh, can master to achieve, achieve the highest level of uh, performing ultra fine surgical procedures. A person needs the incentive, knowledge, experience, uh, education, and many years training. Uh, thank you very much. I wish you uh, uh, good luck. Uh, welcome in Moscow, Russia. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Zelia. And I really uh, love how you adjust that training to specific needs of neurosurgeons. It's very interesting that you can actually operate either on the eye for ophthalmology, on the brain, um, for the neurosurgeons, it's really important. But the basic idea that um, we all should uh, take from your presentation, people who love their work, they will do better. And I know it is that too. If people like what they do, they do much better. Anyway, so thank you very much. And now we can move to our uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Sintil Morgan, and hopefully he overcome <laughs> his technical problems and will join us. Sintil? I think he's getting ready now. I mean, he can join any, any moment. I made him as a presenter now. Okay, great. Yay! Yep. <laughs> perfect, perfect, yeah. All right, Sintil, let's talk. Please, Can we hear him? Dr. Sanil, can you unmute yourself? We can't hear you. Dr. Sanil, we can't hear you. Sorry. I can see a slide, but can't hear you. I think as a host, you can unmute him. Friends, can you unmute him? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, Dr. Singh, yeah, please go ahead now. I have unmuted yourself. Can go ahead and start talking. We 
you can see you, Dr. Chandil, you can see you now. I can't hear you now. Is your volume button down in your laptop? Uh, Dr. Sendil, um, we can see your slides. What we can do is you can call me the mobile phone, keep talking so that I can uh, project the audio to the speaker. In a way, at least we can hear something. Terence, you probably should call him. Oh, he does calling you. <laughs> oh, boy. Can you hear? Can the faculty hear Dr. Sendil speak now? Yes. Can you hear? Yeah, please go ahead. We can hear you, sir. Please go ahead. Parents, you're on mute. Is it audible? No. No, we can't hear him. Try again because we can. No. We didn't even hear you too. You were on mute. Try again. Maybe uh, he, uh, he start talking. Uh, Dr. Sandil, uh, can you speak? Yep. Yeah. Can we hear Dr. Sandil's talk? No. No. Um, Dr. Sandil? I've made a special arrangement for your talk. I kept a speaker also for you that it can be um, amplified. Uh, is it audible at least a partially to us? I can hear you, Dr. Chandil, but I'm just trying to relay your audio to the uh, audience. No, I can't hear anything. We can't hear any reason. Okay. Um, we hear you. He can t tell you on the phone and you will translate. <laughs> I'm trying to, trying to amplify the speaker system now. I'm, uh, yeah, I have unmuted yourself. Uh, can we all hear now, uh, Dr. Sandil's um, voice? No. Okay. 
No, I cannot hear anything. We can hear you, but we can't uh, hear him for some reason. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think the, uh, we can't hear your audio in the system. Uh, I can hear your voice here. Um, um, no. I can hear you, Dr. Sindhil. I can hear you completely. Your, uh, try, try turning off noise removal in uh, the audio. WebEx has a function with smart audio. If you turn off noise removal, Sindhil, it might be thinking now? that it's... Dr. Sindhil, can you speak now? No, sorry, we can't hear you. I've tried to uh, keep the noise uh, reduction also through the settings. And Dr. Elena, what should we do now? Well, poor Sintil. I don't know. I guess, well, can can he talk to you on the phone and you will just translate? Uh, I can do that. I was trying to um, connect this audio to the system, but unfortunately, the audio is all too uh, uh, feeble that it can't be transmitted. Um, <clears throat> Well, he can advance the slides and he can talk to you and you will just say what he was saying. I mean, we can read it, but uh, oh, that's unfortunate. He worked so hard in his center for teaching microsurgery for years. It's just unfortunate. And it's funny, you are the same country. <laughs> and from Russia, we all somehow connected. <laughs> and you guys are the same country. <laughs> it's, it's happened. It, it, I know it's it happening. It's okay. Uh, the only thing that you can do, Terence, is just he will tell you, and you will say it on the phone. Yeah, can, can you put can like, can you put them on WhatsApp and you just put the phone next to the speaker? I'm I'm just trying that. Let me see. Call him on WhatsApp. Well, I mean, if anybody wants from the audience for now, maybe if there are any questions, um, you can guys ask and we can answer because we had all of the present presenters now um, finished. I had a few questions uh, during that talk and I answer it and I think uh, working with a small vessel, it's uh, very useful uh, to use maybe epigastric vessels. The people were asking what, how you practice on super microsurgery um, on a rat and you can use epigastric, which is 0 0.3 to 0 0.5, 0 0.6 millimeters using 11O and that would be a great model. And all information for our courses are available online and you can get all information uh, on the Google if there is anybody who wants to come um, to any of the courses. But this is idea of this presentation is to promote uh, microsurgery, help you to develop courses in your own. And if there are any questions, please make sure you have our emails, email um, any of the speakers. Uh, and we will be happy to answer all your questions. It was great uh, to have all of this. So the um, guide, a few tech, good textbooks and microsurgery. Um, there is many, many textbooks and microsurgery. I'm using myself a textbook written by Dr. Cooley, Brian Cooley. Um, uh, C O O L E Y Brian, and he were he wrote a very good book on his good friend of mine, and he wrote a good book on teaching. It's called Textbooks Manual of Microsurgery, and it's a great book. Dr. Ackland published uh, a book as well, and um, but there is a tons of uh, microsurgery. A lot of videos available. Uh, we teach by videos. All videos I created they're online on YouTube. And uh, you can you can watch them for free and uh, try to practice if you can uh, using those uh, step by step a very um, detailed video on the YouTube channel for the orthopedics 
in uh, Columbia University. You can find them easily and you can see them. If any questions, please, you know, refer to me directly or to all our speakers. Um, if you guys would like to share your emails, if there is anybody who wants to have any, have any questions, you can uh, put it in the chat. Um, so where are we standing, Terrace, with uh, Dr. Sintil? Uh, meanwhile, you can have some questions. I'll try and uh, get Dr. Sintil somehow in. Um, we can take one or two questions probably, and then probably, uh, if time permits, we can uh, get Dr. Sintil in. Yeah, well, I did answer the questions that I had posed. Any, um, I don't think I have any more. Uh, we have one more uh, final chance of hearing Dr. Sendil. Can you hear Dr. Sendil now? Sir, please go. No. Sir, I can hear you, but uh, yeah, I can hear you. This volume is not being uh, heard. Can you hear? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, please. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. 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 One minute. One minute. Thank God. <laughs> okay. So, can you hear me? Perfect. Go ahead, go ahead. Thanks a lot. Once again, uh, the challenging task uh, Dr. Elena has given for me to share the, such a <laughs> vast experience uh, based on the technical issues. Uh, thank you so much for the patience. Uh, so far, uh, you have spent a precious time on uh, listening to me despite all the flaws in this. So what I'm going to talk about this, why we need to teach about uh, microsurgery for uh, my part is maxillofacial surgery. Uh, being hailing uh, 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 from a dental background, uh, without a, a full term of uh, medical uh, training uh, we have undergone we are supposed to undergo a lot of uh, training process to execute these kind of proce procedures with that limited knowledge so apart from the master of dental surgery maxillofacial surgery this part of training has to be done by the resident that is the main uh, theme of this presentation so what we do actually in india is after five years of undergraduation of dental background and followed by we'll have a maxillofacial background for three years so totally eight years and following which the microsurgery and the microsurgery is not a exclusive component as far as india uh, indian standards are concerned they we always have a in, in incorporation with the oral oncology followed by microsurgery so so that part will take at least two to three years to get proper training in the reconstructive microsurgery. We undertake all kind of uh, flaps with available, uh, you know, uh, all simulated mannequins or sometimes cadaver dissections from the flap part is concerned. Whereas the second phase, otherwise the anastomosis part uh, is uh, on the lab training as Selena was, uh, you know, very uh, dynamically, she has explained the each and every uh, things, uh, everything uh, from uh, you know jumping from flaws to failures, how to overcome all those things. So that part is taken care of, care of by her always. So why the maxillofacial surgeons need first is the patient flow. As far as orofacial part is concerned, dentist and the maxillofacial surgeons are the first people, uh, first clinic where we get a lot of oral cancer patients, where the ablative surgery is the integrated part of oral cancer. Or some of the benign lesions may also require a wide resection, which eventually results in a huge defect with the loss of uh, form and function. So in order to restore the basic functions and to some extent the form, uh, microsurgery is being taught in uh, India. So uh, these are all the causes which made us to take this precious uh, syllabus for uh, now we execute uh, on the patients. One is the ablative surgeries for malignant and benign lesions. Second is the secondary deformities. Usually, uh, demography, Indian demographies, we'll get a lot of uh, high velocity road traffic accidents, irrespective of all the rules uh, which has been implemented. So we always <clears throat> eventually result in such a huge defect where nothing can be done other than the flaps. Usually comes with a secondary defect. <clears throat> Sorry. 
thirdly with a chronic infection despite so much of antibiotics so much of uh, sterilization protocols we follow some of the chronic infection which can't be addressed using uh, all these measures so that kind of tissue loss has to be addressed but recently we come across a lot of post covid patients with mycormycosis which has got a lot of maxillary defect very commonly there is a communication between the oral and the orbital and the oral and the nasal complex so those kind of defects need to be addressed using the flaps so for that that part of the clinical significance we have to get trained in this osteoradionecrosis or osteonecrosis the therapeutic amino bisphosphonate induced osteonecrosis or uh, you know osteoradionecrosis or will definitely will have uh, only optional wear free flaps the last but not the least is the congenital deformity some of the congenital deformities wide for example wide cleft which can't be approximated in one surgery or multiple surgeries then we have to think about the flaps and the incorporated microsurgery <clears throat> so for a benign lesions what we do is, this is the you can appreciate the orthopatomography x ray which showing the angle to angle sub angle to the angle we have that defect which is going to the patient is going to lose that So in that case, we harvest the flap, and the conventional way of suturing we do it most of the time. And some of the technical advancements and the gadget advancements we are going to discuss a little. So we can appreciate the fibula graft is placed in the lower border. The anastomosis is done with your conventional micro suturing. The second is again a benign lesion which uh, defect in the lateral surface of the uh, mandible of the lower or a lower jaw. <clears throat> Instead of going for a micro suturing, we apply. Couplers, sometimes venous couplers. Uh, it is available in various sizes, 1.5 to 7 millimeter of diameter. It is available, and it has got a components like pins, titanium spikes, and uh, contra contrast to that, you will have aperture so that the aperture will get engaged with your uh, pins, titanium pins. This is one of the advancement. What is the advantage with this? Is reducing the operating time for a beginner. For a beginner, I am telling not experienced people. But for a beginner, it be a very uh, useful for this. Despite having so much of cost, it is around uh, more than uh, more than twenty uh, to thirty thousand rupees of uh, Indian rupee. So uh, the third is the uh, again a lesion, which a congenital, uh, uh, which is called a, which is having a hypoplastic mandible later, and then it uh, developed osseo ossifying fibroma in which we used. the staples micro staples the advantage with the micro staple is never go into the endothelial surface so whenever there is a least insult to the endothelial surface the outcome is better that is the study says uh, study is uh, given in a lot of uh, literatures and the last but not least the laser anastomosis this is upcoming field again it is no time you can finish the process of anastomosis within the given time ischemic time before the flap goes for a ischemia So let it be 120 minutes, two hours maximum. The flap can live without blood circulation. So in that time, this uh, laser anastomosis, diode lasers are really, really helpful, which is just incorporating the outermost adventitia layer or not going beyond uh, beyond the smooth muscle layer. That is the advantage, and it needs a amplification media like like a dye or you know or hemo hemoglobin is useful, but methylene blue is ideal which will stay for a long time in the vessel wall so that that you can solder the vessel walls this again uh, one of the boons in becoming uh, you know uh, to make it easy for a beginners the one more is the fibrin glue this fibrin glue can't be used alone but it can be used it can minimize the number of sutures if you put seven or eight sutures in a 2 mm 10 mm 2 mm wall Uh, instead of putting too many sutures giving so much of trauma to the vessel wall we can reduce the number of sutures in between the slits between the inter suture slit can be sealed with this fibrin glue this again on easiest puzzle but still you have to depend upon the oldest methods this is a cancer patients with a palatal uh, lesion who has undergone a radial forearm flap with anastomosis and this is the flap uh, addressed with the radial forearm and later it becomes like this and now it is like this completely got epithelialized mucosal epithelialization has taken place and with this i would like to thank the entire team for uh, for two things one is patiently waiting for me to present and the second is listening to my presentation so this part of maxillofacial surgeons will definitely need a microsurgery training as many of the countries 
uh, or the, the surgical part is the flap harvesting part is done by the surgeon, whereas the uh, the the rest of the anastomosis part done by the residents or the trained uh, technologists. So in that cases, the number of as the number of patients flow keep on increasing, we have to think about this. So it is an easy procedure to learn, and you can execute many kind of techniques as uh, Elena was clearly elaborating on this on this part. The anastomosis part, and the second is neuroraphy. That is neuro cooptation is easily done with the alternative methods. Apart from the so, suturing method, these are all the advantages with the alternative methods. So I would like to thank thank once again, and uh, and uh, Terence who has offered this opportunity for uh, to start this uh, webinar from uh, from uh, India, the motherland for us, as well as incorporating all the. Uh, overseas people from Columbia University, Russia, and other people. I thank you once again, and thank you. I'm very sorry for this technical issue. Thank you. Well, that's okay. Well, I'm really glad you overcame these issues. And uh, <laughs> as we are all very patient, <laughs> because we're all microsurgeons. <laughs> so, but um, I'm really glad you joined us and you're doing an amazing job. And um, it's really great that you keep going, no matter what, all your difficulties um i know which and india is not um a country that will compare financial support uh like from us or even sometimes in russia but you keep going and it's really amazing uh that uh, your stamina and your enthusiasm and your goal and you never give up so i'm really hope that your institute will grow and uh, anything i can do to support i will and I'm really glad you joined this uh, panel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll work together surely. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think we answer most a lot of questions. So there are a lot of questions about um, the country that I cannot afford, uh, and people are not that um, financially savvy to attend courses like you know in Colombia or in Moscow or, so there are tons of things that you can do and there are um, models that you can use and using your surgical loops using the chicken you bigger vessels you can use um, hearts you know the uh, the um, I think the cow hearts or the pig hearts where you can suture vessels there is a lot of models are published and uh, people from Indonesia, this is a maxillofacial surgeon, so I need help. And maybe you can contact Dr. Morgan and um, Sintil, if you can put your maybe email on the chat. Uh, there are people who are in your part of the world and they are maxillofacial surgeons. So that maybe you will be more familiar with the models that you, they can use uh, to practice their microsurgical skills. We can help. So we here to introduce ourselves, to open up the world of micro, microsurgical education. We all have uh, contacts and we would like to help you guys from, I know there are you know, parts where you cannot really pick up uh, the plane tickets and flew to New York or to Moscow or to Tomsk and but we are available and it's the whole idea and I'm really grateful to Dr. Terence to organize uh, seminars like this to bring the community together and open up to this uh, on social media then people can see and listen to us and ask questions. Um, I'm really grateful and I'm grateful to all of you to join and it's very late in Tomsk and I know in Moscow it's already evening. Thank you very much. And I hope we'll uh, do this again at some time, maybe on another topics. Sure, sure, Dr. Lina, we'll do it. We we'll hope to do it in the future also. And thank you, uh, one and all, for joining us uh, in this uh, great event uh, with a lot of uh, you know, new interesting facts and new interesting ideas. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lina, Dr. Sendil, Dr. Mikhail, Dr. Zalia, uh, Dr. Constant, and Dr. Julia. Thank you very much for your wonderful contribution this evening. Uh, thank you all. Bye-bye. Uh, Stay safe. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, sir. Finally, you made it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, I was totally depending upon this laptop. Uh, was
so I try to uh, stretch so that you can uh, get some time to talk because you're doing wonderful job there. Amazing. Thanks. Work on law, no work on law number. Sure, sir. Anytime, anytime. You can anytime you can call me. Can do, can do. Nice, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye, sir. Good night. I'll be in touch. Bye, bye. Sure.